uh, and it hadn't yet recovered from the area's deforestation in the peak farming era. Uh, now, because of the range of the history we'll cover today, uh, I've broken it down into some easily digestible sections. So we'll start with uh, the early development first, and then we'll look at the school, the mill, and then this house. Uh, now, <laughs> Old Young Township wasn't surveyed until 1795. Uh, but potential claimants already had their eyes on certain areas, and Joseph Jessup was one of those. Uh, now, one myth about this early period is that the settlers drew their lots out of a hat, so it, uh, getting a lot was a rather random process. Uh, now, this may be true for the uh, lowest on the pecking order, uh, but in reality, the process was much more organized, and those claimants with influence had first choice. And the other myth is that receiving the lots only began once the survey was done. Uh, and there must have been a preliminary survey, as some of the claimants had already picked their lots earlier than uh, the survey in 1795. For instance, uh, Benoni Wilsey was already building his mill in, in uh, the future Wilsey town in 1795. Mm -hmm. And the surveyor, uh, Louis Grant, uh, mm -hmm. stated that he had settled on the lot in 1792. And Joseph Jessup's claim began even earlier. The next slide. Yeah, that should be it. Okay. Now, Jessup's first application uh, for specific lots in the township was in 1790. And he specifically requested lots one to four in the seventh and eighth concessions, and lots one, two in the east half of lot three in the ninth concession. And this gave him a, a 2,100 acre grant. And you can see this grant outlined in blue on the map. Uh, now, it wasn't by accident that he selected that property. Uh, the Jessops were from a milling family uh, in the American colonies. And just to drive uh, that point home, he also obtained the land where Macintosh Mills would be established, as well as uh, the falls at Young Mills, and also a mill site near Lynn, which he actually operated. Now, his land at Alp also had other things going for it. Uh, the surrounding land was good farmland, and roads were already being established before he even received his patents in 1799. <laughs> and what this meant in practical terms uh, was that the land was very marketable. So he stood to make a lot of money selling off and developing the properties. Now, uh, the roads in red were established as public roads before 1802. And uh, the only date we know for sure is uh, the one that we now know as Highway 42, which would be this one. Uh, and it was uh, put in between Brockville and Delta in 1794. Now, Addison Road and Shaw Road, I don't know how familiar everybody is with the geography here, but this is Addison Road here, and this is Shaw Road down here. It doesn't actually go all the way anymore. Uh, but they were put in before uh, 1802. Uh, and that boxed in the, the whole site of Bell, which was surrounded by roads. Uh, so it was easy to get around there very early on. Uh, now, it wasn't until 1811 that the next batch of roads started to be open to the public. Now, using the word road uh, for what existed at the time does a disservice to the definition of road. Uh, you know, the first roads are more like paths through the woods, and people had to navigate around stumps and, and trees and rocks and swamps uh, to get to wherever they were going. And there was no real attempt to build a road, it was just finding a way through. Uh, and it would be decades before anything we would recognize as a road evolved. And this picture is of a surviving road in Old Shaytown. And a road like this would have been con considered a super highway even into the mid 1800s. <laughs> now, in this image, the original roads are again in red and Jessup's grant in blue. And now there's some other roads in green that also had an impact on Elm. And here we can see the Wilson Town Road and the Eighth Line Road and the Osborne Road that, that originally ran all the way down into the front of town and then the uh, Glen Elm Road. Uh, now, the 1811 road that we call now Osborne Road was established as a public road, uh, and it passed Judson's Mill at, at Temperance Lake on the way. 
and the Wilsey Town Road was made public in 1816, although this it, it could have been earlier, this hints of that. And the Eighth Line Road in 1819, but the Elbe Road wasn't made public until 1828. Now, what do I mean by made public? Well, many of these first paths or roads were created by the early settlers just using a common route to get to their properties, and no one was responsible to maintain them. Uh, and the local settlers had to petition uh, the district court of quarter sessions uh, to have a road laid out and made public. Uh, and with this designation, it was then legal for the local governments to spend money to maintain them. <laughs> Now, both the 1811 Osborne Road and the 1821 Elbe Road reports had something to say about the school at Elbe, but we'll get into that in a moment. Now, this map uh, shows how much of Jessup's land was initially sold. Now, each lot covered 200 acres, uh, and the lots colored orange were purchased by George Bates and members of his family, and those in green were uh, bought by members of the Benjamin Brown family. And out of the 2,100 acres, the Bates plant purchased about 1,000 acres, and the Brown plant 400 acres. And the land across the town line in Elizabethtown uh, was just as rich and productive as, as uh, that land near Elb. And this meant uh, that the activities in Elb had a regional impact, because they drew in people from Elizabethtown as well. Uh, and as we'll see, the members of the Bates and Brown's families were prominent in township affairs for several uh, generations. Now the land around the mill itself was chopped into several pieces. Uh, that's in this part here. Uh, uh, so it's more difficult to show uh, and we'll discuss that as we move on. And now we'll take a look at the school and how it developed and its impact, not only on L but on the township as a whole. Now in my book about the wandering schools in the township, I speculated that the, uh, the first school at L opened between 1800 and 1805. Uh, and this was based on some old school superintendent's records found at the Archives of Ontario. Uh, and these were the early estates given uh, by the Elb School trustees. And they, the trustees were all members of the local communities. So if anybody's going to know, it's going to be them. Uh, now, surprisingly, when I looked at some of the old road reports, I found other mentions of the school. And they confirmed these early, early dates and even the location. Uh, and one was in the 1828 Elb uh, Road opening, where it stated that the road began beside the school. Uh, and the second and most important reference uh, was in the 1811 surveyor's report uh, for the opening of what that we now call Osborne Road. Now, it wasn't mentioned in the road report itself, but the surveyor did mention it in his report uh, that the road running up from the front of Young ended at the Wilsey Town Road, or now modern Highway 42, near the schoolhouse. Uh, and from what I've just mentioned, we can draw a couple of conclusions. Uh, in the first, uh, the school was always located about where it is today, or where the, the, the old building is. And second, it was one of the first schools in all of Leeds and Granville counties. And it's interesting that the only schools to rival that distinction were the neighboring schools in Wilson Town in Soperton and the rear of Lansdowne. So it appears that Farmersville's later interest in promoting education had its roots uh, deep in this part of the township. Uh, and it was Joshua Bates from Elm who established Farmersville and pushed for schools in that village. Now, something else that should be mentioned is that those schoolhouses weren't, weren't only to educate children. Uh, since they were central to the community, they also served as uh, meeting halls for community business, social events, as churches, as revival halls, as theaters, and even as polling stations and elections. Uh, now, there are other reasons to believe that there was a school that early. I, I'm pushing this point because it's important. Uh, the population numbers uh, from some of the early township census returns uh, do give us some clues, but these records had to be handled with care uh, as no lots and concessions were given for the families. But based on, on some of the known settlers in the Elbe area, uh, we can be uh, sure uh, that at a minimum, there were 74 people uh, settled in the area in 1803. Now, 29 of those were boys and 23 were girls under the age of 16, which meant that 70% of the population was under 16 years old. Uh, now, only 50% of those were of school age. That still amounts to 26 children. 
Uh, so there was definitely a need for a school. Uh, and there's still another reason to believe that the school was operating uh, at that time. Now, some of these early school age children in the Elbe area became prominent in township affairs. Uh, now, the most well known, of course, was Joshua Bates, who established several businesses in Farmersville in the 1830s, including its first mill. Now, besides being involved in many businesses, he entirely promoted uh, both elementary and secondary education in the village. And two of his brothers, uh, Ninian and James, were also notable due to the education they received at Elm. Uh, now, Ninian was a township reeve in 1858, as well as being involved in several township enterprises, such as the uh, Plank Road Company and the Brockville to Westport Mail Stage Line. So he was quite an entrepreneur. And he also had an interest in the mills at McIntosh Mills, and even acted as a land agent at times. So you'll see there's a, a good reason to follow an Indian's career. Now, James Bates uh, was a township assessor in 1834, and Case Brown, another graduate of the school, uh, was a township assessor in 1816. Now, it's clear that all of the above learned organizational writing and mathematical skills at the Elf School. Uh, now, our, on, on these assessments, their handwriting and signatures are well-crafted. Uh, so they, they took to the learning quite well. Uh, and we even know the name of the teacher in 1812. Uh, he was Andrew Bradish, a half pay captain. Uh, and Bradish also became the, the first teacher at the school in Gananoque in 1816. Uh, now, according to the school trustees reports, uh, a frame school was built to replace the lock school in 1815. Uh, and in these early school reports, the trustees reported that the frame school was 24 feet by 24 feet. Uh, and it survived until 1853. And then Chauncey H. Bellamy uh, sold a quarter acre where the present old schoolhouse sits to the trustees for 12 pounds, 10 shillings. Uh, and there must have been a fire as it took a while to get the new building operational. In both 1853 and 54, uh, the school was only open for six months each year. Uh, now, how these schools operated is too large a subject to get into here, but it's covered in my book on the, on the township one-room schools. Now, one thing to note is that the building the new school uh, cost the new, new cost the school section 150 pounds in 1853. Now, the, the history of the schoolhouse was uneventful uh, after that until the Christmas break of 1887. And here we can rely on a school ledger uh, for the school that began in 1887. And it was kindly donated uh, by Bruce Topping. Now its survival is a minor miracle and true copies were made by Bruce with one copy being donated here as well as the original. And another copy went to the Athens Museum. Now his mother, Mary Brown Topping uh, was one of the last uh, teachers at the school and kept it after the school closed thankfully. But back to the story. On the 28th of December, uh, the annual meeting uh, of the school committee was held at the school, and nothing was noted as, as wrong. Uh, but it burned sometime between then and their 4th of January, 1888, special meeting. And in that meeting, uh, the school ratepayers had to decide where to build a new school. Uh, and so they decided to build it on the same footprint. But this stone school has cost $540 this time. So we can see inflation at work. <laughs> now, uh, from then on, the school operated with that much fanfare until the end of the one room school era. But one thing the ledger supplied, which is quite rare these days, is the corporate seal of the school section. You can see it here, school section number two. Uh, now, also included in the ledger were some of the contracts with the teachers. And this bright red seal was affixed to the contract for the new school teacher in the fall of 1888. And the trustee signatures were written beside the seal and the teacher signed below. So you can see we've got uh, Muscle Bates and John, uh, Johnson and Cornell, or Richard Cornell. Uh, now, Anna Coffey of Whitby was the first teacher at the new school and that's her signature there. Uh, and this illustrates a problem uh, common to all these one-room schools is finding teachers. Uh, 
and that they had to recruit from as far away as Whitby demonstrates this very pointedly. Uh, and another thing the ledger contains is the names of the school trustees during this time. Uh, and many Brown and Bates family members uh, served as trustees. And one other name that stands out is that of Richard Cornell, who lived in the Chauncey Bellamy Jr. house on Elm Road. Well, there's more about that house a little later. Uh, now, Cornell was deeply involved in uh, the Elk School's administration, as well as being very prominent in township affairs. Uh, now, this 1888 school here still stands, but has been turned into a residence. Uh, but this photo is from its last days as a schoolhouse, but the current residents have maintained it admirably. Uh, now, be besides this house, it is one of the few original uh, buildings left from the Golden Age of Elm. And now we'll get into the critical importance of the falls at Elm. Uh, and without the falls, there wouldn't have been the community that thrived here for over 100 years. Now, this photo was taken in the spring of 2020 by Art Shaw. Uh, but as you can see, Mother Nature never rests. And notice that the falls are now reforested. Now, as mentioned earlier, the land was patented by Joseph Jessup in 1799. And the mill land was sold to uh, Seth Downs in 1806. And he in turn sold it to David Coleman in 1808. And Coleman in turn sold it to Charles Jones in 1809. And Jones held on to it until 1817 when he sold it back to uh, Joseph Jessup. And it remained in Jessup's hands until he died in 1821. Now, this is the early history on the ownership level. And a mill was never mentioned in any of the land transactions. Uh, but it should be noted uh, that all of these men had previous connections with mills. Uh, Seth Downs had operated Joel Stone's first mills in Gananoque. And David Colin was a brother of the Colins who ran the mill at Lynn. And Charles Jones had the mill at Young Mills uh, that, that had once belonged to Joseph Jessup. But other things were going on uh, that show another side to the story. Uh, the township assessments are a gold mine of information concerning mills. Uh, and the, the township, even from its earliest days, like today, wanted its pound of flesh. And to that end, the mills were taxed. So we have a good record of when those mills opened and what type of mills uh, were taxed. And it's interesting to note that none of the people involved in the land transactions were actually involved in the milling. They were just the owners, not the operators. Uh, now, the, the first mention of a mill at Elm was on the 1805 assessment. So it was very early. And, and this would have meant that it was built at the latest in 1804. Now, in that year, the assessment was levied against Benjamin Brown Sr. Uh, for only a sawmill. And in 1806, it was taken over by Benjamin Jr. and uh, a couple of his partners. And notable among them were uh, Philip Phillips and Nathan Brown. Uh, now, Phillips lived nearby and was one of those people who seemed to have some type of involvement in just about every lucrative enterprise in the township. Now, in some years, the assessment also included a grist mill but it wasn't included every year, which is odd. Uh, now, after 1810, the assessments get sporadic, uh, but both the missions uh, were for a very bureaucratic reason, it turns out. Uh, now, the people who owned the land in the township, but didn't live in the township, were on a different assessment list, and none of these appear to have survived, and the employees at the mill wouldn't have been paying the taxes. Uh, now, the existence of these other town uh, or out of township uh, list brings up the very real possibility that Jessup may have been operating a mill at Elb as early as 1799 while he was living in Elizabethtown. And that would have been uh, where the first owners all had milling backgrounds. It was a, a big club. Uh, now, milling seems to have run in the blood of the Brown family. Uh, two of Benjamin Sr.'s other sons, uh, Jonathan and Daniel, opened the first mill in what is now Bill's Mills in 1809. And a cousin of Benjamin's, Jonah Brown, uh, opened the first mill in what is now known as Leaders Mill uh, in the future Shea Town in 1811. And in 1815, he partnered with Peter Howard uh, and bought the mill from Jonathan and Daniel. But Jonah was a bit of a black sheep in the family. And in the 1820s, he spent several years in prison in, or in, in York uh, for defrauding another land speculator. 
uh, and it was in 1818 that we first hear of the Bellamy's. Uh, the higher Bellamy uh, was assessed for a grist and a sawmill that year. And in 1819, Joseph Jessup sold the land we're now sitting on uh, to John and Sterling Deming. Now it didn't include the mill site, but they were assessed for a sawmill that year. And in 18, 19, 20, and 21, we find Chauncey Bellamy in L, but only with a low assessment, uh, suggesting he was working at the mill, but he didn't rent or own it. Uh, and also in L were his brothers, Hiram and Samuel, who went on to have their own mills. Uh, now, Joseph Jessup died in 1821, and his daughter, uh, now Hannah McIntosh, uh, inherited all his land holdings. And from his will, we learned that uh, there was still a mill at Elvin 1821, because his mill in part says that part on which a grist and sawmill have been erected. Uh, and here again, we run into the uh, owner living out of the township problem. Now, Hannah and her husband, John, lived on the Jessup farm by near Lynn in Elizabethtown. And with that in mind, it was probable that the mill operated uh, with only the employees living in the township between 1822 and 1832, because there's no other record of the mill in that time period in, in this township. Now, in 1833, Chauncey Bellamy re-entered the picture at Elm. Now, he bought the mill site from Hannah McIntosh and her family. Uh, and it was interesting that all the family members, uh, even the children, were mentioned in the sale document. Uh, and uh, Bellamy bought it for 450 pounds in 1833. Now, at a casual glance, it seems like a straightforward uh, a business agreement between strangers, uh, but it was far from it. Both the Bellamy's and John McIntosh were from the same small town in Vermont, uh, and both came from milling backgrounds. Uh, and to add to this, John C. Bellamy had married Nancy Bolton in uh, 1817, while John McIntosh had married Hannah Jessup. Now, it was only with a little further research that it was discovered that uh, Nancy and Hannah were half-sisters. Uh, there were a lot of these interfamily connections concerning the mill property over the following decades, uh, but family ties only go so far. Uh, the McIntoshes managed to extract another 500 pounds from Chauncey in 1844. And uh, now just what type of claim they still had on the property isn't known. But the transaction was called a, a quit claim in the land record. Now, this is an undated uh, charcoal sketch of Chauncey Sr. Uh, and traveling charcoal artists uh, were very common before cameras came on the scene. Uh, and even the first photographers in the area were also itinerants uh, before photo studios uh, came established. Now, it was after Chauncey Sr.'s purchase of the site that the mills began to evolve uh, into what we picture today. Now he removed the old wooden mills and initiated a program uh, to replace the buildings with the more durable local stone. And his business was so successful that he was able to uh, build himself a two-story stone house in 1838. Uh, and this shouldn't be confused with Chauncey Jr. stone house on Elk Road. They're two completely separate buildings. Uh, now, Junior's house was built on Elk Road in 1850, and it had several ups and downs in its history, including the death of one of Junior's daughters, uh, burning to death. Uh, and it even became a derelict at one point. But it's now, as you can see, it's been beautifully restored. And if, if anybody goes off Elk Road, it's easy to tell which one it is. Uh, now, it appears that over time, Chauncey Sr. and Junior uh, were conflated into one person. Uh, which has led to some confusing stories. Now, one important misconception is that the house in Elk Road belonged to Senior. Now, in legal documents, uh, Chauncey Senior was always referred to as Chauncey H, as in Hall, uh, while Junior was simply referred to as Chauncey. Uh, so with that in mind, it was usually easy to separate the two individuals in the legal documents. Uh, but now we'll get back to uh, Chauncey H's house. Uh, now, it was built at the end of the mill road beside the mills. Uh, now, this map was produced by Art Shaw a few years ago, based on what was known at the time. But subsequent research has turned up some new finds, and I've overlaid them on this map, which includes the uh, location of Bellamy Senior's house at the end of Mill Road, and even the barn behind this house, uh, which wasn't uh, 
nobody knew what it looked like when this map was made. And Chauncey's house was way up here, right across from the mills, and it was in a big apple orchard beside it. Yeah. Uh, there are stories handed down about a large boarding house on the property that Chauncey built for his mill workers. And, and a lot of them say Chauncey Jr. built it. Uh, now, this is only partly true. It disguises its original purpose. Uh, now, one can see from its elegant facade that it wasn't merely a boarding house. Now, originally, it had 12 rooms uh, that housed the Bellamy family and perhaps the lead millers and their families. And after the, uh, the end of the Bellamy era in the 1800s, it was divided into apartments. And on the 1891 census, there were four families sharing the building, each with four rooms. Uh, now, this building, like most of the others, was lost to fire, as well as you can tell. Uh, now, a date hasn't been confirmed, but it would have been in the early uh, years of the 1900s. Uh, now, in 1981, Harry Painting, I don't know how many of you are familiar with him, uh, in one of the many stories about Leeds County uh, in the Brockville Recorder and Times, did a write-up about Allen. Uh, and he found uh, some pictures of the buildings in their ruined state, including this picture. Uh, but who got them from and what happened to them isn't known. And that said, the following images are also from his article, and the only ones known to exist at this point. Uh, unfortunately, Harry wasn't big on citing his sources, so we don't know where he got them from. Uh, now, this image shows the ruins of the grist mill. And the person in the upper doorway was identified as Wallace Brown. Uh, and there's more on Wallace a little further along. Now, painting identified this ruin as, as the remains of a tannery. Uh, now, I found no other reference to this tannery except painting's mention of it. Uh, but now we'll go back to some of the more central facts about the history of the mill itself. Now, in the assessments, Bellamy was assessed. Uh, only for a sawmill in 1833. But by 1834, he had to work in grist mill as well. And by 1837, he introduced a second run of scones to further refine the flour. Uh, and this continued until the end of the available assessment records in 1850. Now, many of you have probably heard he had a distillery. Uh, and the assessment records show that he had one from 1845 to 1849. Uh, and this was the only legal still ever to operate in Old Gum Township. Uh, and it was one of the five legal distilleries that for the whole of the Johnstown district that operated at that time. Now, in 1847, we even know how much liquor he produced. Uh, the return of distilleries uh, showed he produced 330 gallons uh, per batch and expected to produce 9,070 gallons. Now, unfortunately, or fortunately, the 1848 Johnstown District Census also covered distilleries and their production numbers were for the year 1847. And we find that he actually produced 130 hogheads of liquor in 1847. Now, a hogheads was uh, the equivalent of 60 gallons. So we get a, a total amount of 7,800 gallons. Uh, so his production was about 1,200 gallons short of his projection. Uh, at least on paper. <laughs> now, there was whether there was an actual shortfall or the surplus conveniently disappeared, we'll never know. Uh, he was no saint. Uh, and we even learned that it took a little under 25 pounds of grain to produce one gallon of liquor. Uh, that 1848 census also gives us some insights into the mill operation uh, that have been lacking up to this point. In 1847, the grist mill produced 1,500 barrels of flour, uh, and he had an oat mill that produced 2,679 hundredweight of oat product. And the sawmill cut 100,000 uh, board feet of lumber, and he employed eight men at that time. Now, the story about him distilling liquors is a little complicated. In an article in the Farmersville Reporter in 1884, uh, stated that the proprietors finally abandoned this part of the business, partly from conscientious scruples, and partly because the government license was so high that it was becoming unprofitable. Now, the part about scruples needs a bit more elaboration. Uh, now, some of the pressure undoubtedly came from his nephew, 
uh, a man called Aaron Bellamy Pardee. Uh, and he was a popular a fire and brimstone Methodist preacher and temperance man who had a large outspoken following in Leeds and Grenville. Uh, as a matter of fact, Thaddeus Levitt in his history of Leeds and Grenville gushed about his upstanding character. Uh, now there's a certain irony in this, as Chauncey's brother Samuel and even his father in Vermont uh, had distilleries. Uh, now it's fortunate that Harry uh, that Aaron won that battle. Uh, now we shall see that later in the history of the mill, it was his goodwill that saved Bellamy ownership. But in 1856, Chauncey sold a small four acre piece of property between the Mill Road and Elb Road uh, to a John Robeson. And this sale changed the nature of Elb. The property bordered on the main road uh, and the Elb Road and surrounded the school site. So it was right from the old Mill Road right over to Elb Road. Uh, And in the uh, now he was noted, Robeson was noted as, as Tanner in the sale document, uh, which gives credence to Harry Payne and calling uh, one of the ruined buildings a tannery. But the sale document had an interesting stipulation, uh, and it stated that Robeson had the right to erect a dam on his new property. It even uh, defined the size and location of the dam. Now, it isn't known if this dam was ever built. Uh, today, there's no sign of it, but that may be due to time and the, the widening of Highway 42 in the 1960s. Now, this John Robeson also had uh, uh, a store at Elk and was the first postmaster, and he was also living in this house in 1861. Now, after about three decades of successful operation, uh, the mill enterprise almost came apart. In 1858, uh, Chauncey, at the age of 68, took out a large mortgage uh, with a lender in Brockville. And then in 1859, took out another one uh, from the sons of Samuel Bellamy in Augusta. Now, it isn't clear what was going on, uh, but he may have been, become incapacitated as it was some kind of default in the mortgage in 1860. And here we find the Bellamy family closing ranks. Uh, there in party, uh, bought out the mortgages in July of 1860 for $5,000. And two days later, sold the mill to Chauncey's brother, Samuel. And a couple of weeks later, Chauncey himself signed off on his interest in the mills to Samuel for a nominal $5. Now, for years after this, there were, there were too many interfamily legal transactions uh, concerning the mill to get into here. There were dozens of them. Uh, and it wasn't until 1869, or three years after Chauncey died, that things settled down a bit. And John B. Bellamy and uh, his father-in-law, William Dowling, sold what was left of the mill property to Chauncey's son, Edward. And a John L. Robeson, this was a second John Robeson, uh, and this worked for a couple of years. And this was when the 1871 census uh, was taken. So we get another look at the mill operations. Uh, now in 1870, the grist mill produced 12,000 bushels of flour and provender for animal feed um, and 120,000 board feet of lumber. And there was no mention of a tannery operation. But there were some other interesting bits of information about the, well, the mill. Um, for instance, we learned that uh, the operation had $400 in fixed capital and $200 in floating capital. Now, that doesn't sound like much today, but 150 years ago, a dollar was worth a lot more than it is now. Uh, that would have been in the thousands. Uh, now that was, uh, and we also learned that the mill employed two men and operated for six months of the year. And it was also solely water powered uh, and the water flow had a force of 30 horsepower, which was pretty good. And the only other mill in the township that still operated solely on water power uh, was the mill at Beals Mills. Uh, but it wouldn't be long before steam engines would be introduced at Elm. Uh, and that, of course, extended the milling season. And here again, we see some family connections. Edward Bellamy uh, was married to John L. Robeson's sister, Rachel. And John's brother, uh, William, was married to Edward's sister, Abigail. Uh, now, Edward and John sold the mill to William in 1871, and he sold it back to Edward in 1874. Uh, 
And now the uh, Bellamy brand is back in charge. And on the 1881 census, we find that uh, Edward and Rachel were living in Chauncey's two-story stone house uh, with their family. And listed in the same household were two millers and their families, uh, which brings us back to the story about the house being called the boarding house. Uh, now the mill would probably have continued successfully under Edward, but fate had other plans. And he died of typhoid fever in 1882 at only 42 years of age. Uh, now with his death, the Bellamy era came to an end of health. Uh, after a run of almost 50 years. Now, after, after that, the mill went through a series of owners until the mill finally closed. Now, a brief mention uh, will be made here of the owners, uh, but one thing should be noted is the owners ne weren't necessarily the millers. Uh, now, William Harper was the next owner in 1883, and Ephraim Haskins followed in 1887, and Nelson, Nelson White bought the mill in 1892. Uh, now he was followed by George Kincaid in 1895, and he lost it in a mortgage default in 1898, and then it went to Malcolm Coon, and then to Wallace uh, Brown in 1908. And it appears that Francis Blanchard uh, was the last person to operate the sawmill at Elk, and it burned down in 1912 and was never rebuilt. Now it isn't clear when the, the, the grist mill closed. Now the old the old mills at Elk uh, saw the community develop from a, a pre-industrial society in, into an industrial one in a little over a century. And it was steam power that eventually doomed all these old water powered mills. Uh, uh, because with the steam, mills were no longer tied to dams and waterfalls. It could be built almost anywhere. Now I'd like to finish this section by making a couple of observations. Uh, now first, there's a nice symmetry to the fact that Wallace Brown ended up with the property, as it was his ancestor, Benjamin, who was the first known miller. And second, as much as I just like seeing our heritage discarded in such a way, we know that when the highway was rebuilt and widened in the 1960s, the stone ruins were demolished and used for fill in the highway. So you can keep in mind that whenever you drive over this section of road, you're driving over the ghost of the old elk community. <laughs> So now it's time to get to the house itself. And there we, you see the house, what it's going to look like when they're done with it. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this picture. Uh, now it's been called the Evergreen Lodge or the Brown House. You can take your pick which one you like to. Now, once again, we have to go back almost to the beginning. Now, in 1819, Joseph Jessup separated the first piece of property from the mill area, and that's the property this house sits on. Uh, and he sold the 50 acres to uh, John and Sterling Deming uh, for 225 pounds. Now, there was an important stipulation. Jessup reserved the right to overflow, uh, and this strongly suggests once more that there was already a functioning uh, a dam and mill site on the property. Now, by 1829, the boys had accumulated several pieces of property, but their interests were diverging, and there was a partition of deed, with John taking uh, his parts on lots three and seven, and lot three being uh, where we are now, and Sterling took lot eight closer to uh, the fledgling Farmersville. Now, one interesting observation is that the boys arrived with money in their pockets, as they never had to take out a mortgage for the purchase of any of their properties. And they were very successful in their endeavors. And John even had Esquire attached to his name in some of the assessments and census returns. And here we get into another tangent. Uh, it should be noted that the boys married into local families uh, quite quickly on arriving in the area. Now, John married Hannah Woolley, uh, a daughter of William Woolley, who lived on Lot 8, uh, and that's where Sterling would end up farming. And Sterling married. Uh, Eleanor Bates, a sister of Joshua and Indian Bates, and one of their sons became a, a township clerk and a merchant in, in Farmersville for many years. So this takes us back to how importantly education was valued in these families. Now, after arriving, uh, the Demings uh, immediately became involved in milling, and more importantly, in setting up store and livery. And the Deming house was approximately on the site of the prison, because it was somewhere around here. 
um, and was initially constructed of round logs, according to the assessments. Now, it isn't known if uh, John Deming's store was in his house or, or there was an annex. Uh, but John Deming's tenure was cut short in 1833, uh, and it appears he became ill and died shortly after. Now, one of his last acts was to sell the property uh, to uh, Benjamin Hamlin, uh, a wealthy local landowner. And in 1838, Hamlin sold it to uh, George Aldro, who was a, a Rockville lawyer and land speculator, uh, for 300 pounds. And on the same day, Hannah Deming signed off on her dower rights to the property uh, for 12 pounds, 10 shillings. Uh, so it appears likely that Hannah and her kids lived there up until the time it was bought by Aldro. Now, in August of 1839, Aldro uh, sold the property to Ninian Bates uh, for 275 pounds. Now, the difference in the sale price, 300 pounds dropping to 275, would suggest some deterioration in the value of the property uh, for some reason. Uh, now, we do know that uh, Ninian built this house beginning in 1838 or 39 uh, from a couple of sources. In the previous assessments, the Deming House was described as a frame one story. But in 1839, uh, the assessment described Ninian's house as frame under two story or story and a half. Uh, but there's one caveat here. Ninian may have been on the property in 1838 uh, with a promissory note from Aljo. Uh, and this would tally with the 1861 census where it stated that the story and a half house was built in 1838. Now there's some oddities in this house that suggest that Ninian reused much of the uh, Deming House and Barnes uh, in the construction of uh, his new house. And the first find was during the gutting of the house and the discovery of John Deming's store sign. Uh, you now it had been used as backing uh, for the last and plaster in one of the walls. Uh, now in this image, we see how the sign was discovered. Uh, since 1839, it had been covered up in the wall. Now, this indignity was actually fortunate as it preserved the sign in excellent condition. It's actually leaning against the wall over there right now. We will have a special place for this. I would love to just put it right there because actually it's the colors of our forever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was just amazing when they found this one. Okay, and in this image, uh, you can see the sign out of the wall. You can actually see a large dip, but we don't need that now. So <laughs> we need just demonstrate it for us how big it is. Now, as the deconstruction continued, uh, numerous large support timbers uh, were revealed. And from the tooling marks, uh, it was obvious that they'd been recycled. Uh, now, these timbers were very likely from the old Deming buildings uh, that were built beginning around 1819. Now, another source of materials could have been from the old mill buildings uh, that John C. Sr. was demolishing when he replaced them with stone, uh, because this happened about the same time that Ninian was building his house. Now, uh, Deming had gone from a log house to a squared log house to a frame house uh, in the assessments while he was alive. Uh, and there would have been outbuildings as well. So between the, the Deming and the mill buildings, uh, Ninian had a lot of material uh, to recycle for his new house. Now, Ninian and his wife, uh, Elizabeth McIntosh, who was the daughter of Anna Jessup and uh, John McIntosh from earlier in the story, uh, so more family connections, were married about 1835 and raised their six children in this house. And while they lived here, we know some of the activities he was involved in. Uh, in 1838, he acted as a land agent in the sale of the old Judson's Mill at Temperance Lake. And in September of 1842, he bought the mills at McIntosh Mills for a thousand pounds. More family connections with obviously through the McIntoshes. Uh, but the milling didn't seem to suit him and he sold it back to the McIntoshes in April of 1844 uh, for 750 pounds. He didn't take a loss though. 
as in 1850, he extracted another 750 pounds from them and in some type of quit claim. They seem to be good at that stuff. Now, in the township assessments, he was taxed for a merchant shop on this property uh, from 1842 to 1845. And in 1847 and 48, he was taxed for a livery. Uh, now, this may relate to his later known involvement with the stage line. Uh, for instance, in 1842, he had four horses, but by the time of the 1848 Johnstown District uh, Census, he had 19 horses. And then he had involvement uh, with the Farmersville Plant Road Company. It wasn't known until just recently. It ran between uh, Farmersville and Unionville, who well now called Horton. Uh, and he was one of the founders of the company in 1849. And he bought 10 of the 320 shares. Now, only a few of the 96 shareholders bought that many. Uh, and he was one of the directors of the company uh, from 1852 to 1856. And he was elected as a president of the company uh, from 1857 to 1860. And in 1858, he was also the reeve of the township. And it was a busy year for him as he also bought uh, the mail stage line from Jacob Gallinger. Uh, and that was in Farmersville. Uh, and this gives even more credence to the story about uh, this house being used as a stage stop. Uh, now, this was an Indian's first ad in the Brockville Weekly Recorder on the uh, 30th of December, 1858 issue. Now, it's interesting that his son, James McIntosh Bates, was his, one of his agents in Brockville, James M. Bates. Uh, by 1867, uh, James was a lawyer in Merrickville. But as a bit of a trivia, uh, the stages of the day traveled at a blistering uh, five or six miles an hour, which is why it took eight hours to get to Westport. Oh, even, even though, oh well. No, Fran, Francis, what, what I, I like about that, Paul, is the other, the other person's ad that you had in that same email too. That um Gallinger, yeah. um, who had a who was starting a hotel in Farmersville, and he was all you know, Mister Nice, and saying, "Oh, well, if, if it pleases the public, and you know, they might, you know, um, we're we're proud to open up this uh, this uh, building to them, and and not coming and falling all over the place, and not really seeing what he wants." And our mini here, see, line of stages through in eight hours. That's it. <laughs> he, was, he, was, uh, he was an advertiser. <laughs> well, he didn't have a hotel in Farmersville. He took people in. <laughs> he didn't, but he knew how to, he knew how to write it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And now, uh, Francis Walling's map. Uh, helps us visualize uh, the area in 1861. Uh, the route of the Plank Road uh, has been darkened to its full length. You see a left Firesville down Highway 42 and over to uh, Fourth and Unionville. Uh, now, uh, there were two toll gates, uh, one just east of Farmersville and the other just east of Bell uh, across the uh, town line in Elizabethtown. And I think most of you will have picked up on the fact that there are two uh, right angle corners between Farmersville and Elk that don't exist anymore. Uh, and they didn't get rounded out until the automobiles became common and speeds picked up. It was, it was too much of a problem going around 90 degree corners when you do it 60 miles an hour. Now, the road outside uh, has been paved for decades now, but in 1850, it was just a regular dirt road. Uh, and it was built over with wooden planks. Uh, now, this was a popular but short-lived experiment in some districts in the, in the country, but it did produce the name Farmersville Plank Road Company. And the company minute book at, at the Athens Museum even noted that it took 26,400 one-foot wide planks to cover five miles of road. Uh, and the math works. Uh, <coughs> as five miles equals 26,400 feet. Now, although the idea of a plank road sounded good on paper, uh, the planks were rotting and worn out by 1858. 
and it was then converted to a macadamized or gravel road. And those living along the plank road uh, were happy to see it go. It was reported uh, that the wagons traveling on the road uh, created such a racket that it could be heard for miles. Uh, but the plank road name stuck until it closed in 1906. Now by 1860, uh, or yeah, 1860, the Indian had moved closer to Farmersville. And in January of 1860, he sold this house uh, to his son, James McIntosh Bates. And James' intention may have been uh, to use it as a revenue property. And in 1861, he was a law student in Brockville. And we find that on the 1861 census, uh, this house was occupied by John Robeson, who had a store and perhaps a tannery in Elm. Uh, and Robeson was also the first postmaster for the district uh, from June 1857 to uh, November of 1861. And the store and post office were probably located beside the schoolhouse. Uh, and the cheese factory was later built there. Now, this is an enlargement uh, of the Elb area from the previous map. And it shows the households and businesses in Elb. Uh, and the community was crowded. So the map makers had problems getting all the names and businesses in the right place. Uh, but it does give you an idea of the population density of the area. And there were a lot of farms surrounding the area that contributed to the population as well. Now it shows the mill road and, and that the area had the mills, the school, store, post office, as well as a blacksmith. And even in 1861, there was still a lot of Browns and Bates families and living in the area. Now, an 1859 county uh, directory had this to say about El. A new post office station uh, in Young Township on the Westport stage route, beautifully situated in the midst of a fertile country. Uh, the road hence to Farmersville and Unionville is remarkable for the number of uh, well laid out farms and substantial houses. Uh, which may be brought into comparison with any in any portion of Canada. And the new store and post office is near Bates Bridge and adjacent to the, and near the, the property of Mr. Ninian Bates. <coughs> so it was even his name carried a bit of weight. Uh, now this house arrangement didn't work out well for James and he lost a house in a mortgage default in April of 1862. Now, it's interesting that Ninian became the second postmaster at Elk in January of 1862. Uh, but that didn't last long as it closed in April. And it may be that uh, Ninian uh, still had some involvement with this house uh, because the April date for the closing of the post office coincided with the April sale of the house. And the new owner was Richard Foxton, uh, a newly retired mill owner uh, from what we now know as Beals Mills. Hard to get away from Miller's around here. Uh, now, Foxen died in 1867, and his widow Catherine had married a Tom Whaley in, by 1871. Uh, now, it should be noted, I, I didn't put it in here, but uh, by occupation, he was a plasterer. So he may have been responsible for a lot of the plastering that was done in this house. Uh, now, the 1871 census is a true treasure in its scope. I don't know how many people have ever looked at it, but it's fabulous. Uh, now, permit we get a picture of the farm in 1870. Now, there was one house and two stables and barns on 125 acres, but which 80 were improved and 45 uh, were in pasture. And from that, we can see that there were very few trees on the farm, even by that time. Uh, and there was also a one acre garden in an orchard uh, from which they harvested uh, 46 bushels of apples. And the crops asked about on the census included uh, the harvesting of 60 bushels of spring wheat, 15 bushels of barley, uh, 300 bushels of oats, 20 bushels of rye, 50 bushels of corn, and 200 bushels of potatoes. Uh, and the farm also cut 15 tons of hay and produced uh, 200 pounds of meat and sugar, uh, as well as 600 pounds of butter and 32 pounds of wool. And the wool yielded 37 yards of cloth. Uh, most farms still had small flocks of sheep, even by 1871, as the farm wives wove their own cloth from the wool uh, to make clothes, uh, probably at that point, work clothes and kids' school clothes. They weren't going to spend a lot of money on stuff that was going to get damaged. 
Uh, okay, now, this may or may not have been the Byron mentioned on the 1871 census. Uh, this photo is undated, but was probably taken in the 1930s or 40s. Now, now this air photo uh, is a real gem, and it's from 1935. And amongst other things, uh, the land was only sparsely treated, which agrees with the lack of trees uh, in the first photo of the falls. And it shows some of the mill buildings. Uh, I know they're hard to see, but Johnson's house was up in here, the barns and, and the apple orchard. And the mill buildings were here. But what was interesting is 1935, when it shows the L-shaped barn behind the house. And there's the house and there's the stable. And it must have been in the spring because the water was running the, the light was reflecting off the, the white water. So it had to have been in the spring. And you can even still make it up the road going out there. Now in November of 1887, Catherine Fox and Whaley sold a little over three acres of land to the uh, Brockville Westport and Sault Ste. Marie Railroad. And here, the train connection uh, probably wasn't much of a benefit to the mill, uh, but it certainly was for the cheese factory. Now, it offered a cheap way to get their product to Brockville in the wider cheese market. Now, at that time, Canadian cheesemakers sold most of the cheese in the English market. Uh, so the depot itself was rather modest, but it offered storage uh, and some room for passengers in bad weather. Now, because of the boarded up window, the photo appears to be from after 1952 when the, when the rail line closed down. Now, it wasn't until uh, May of uh, 1891 that the property known as H3 on this map, which is the property we're on now, uh, came into the hands of the Brown family. Now, Catherine and her daughter sold it to Munsell Brown uh, the unmarried brother brother of uh, Byron Brown. Uh, and this is noted as, like I say, as H3 on the map. Now, Munsell in turn sold it to his brother Byron for $1 in 1899. Now, it was under Byron's ownership that these separate pieces of property started to be pulled back together again. Uh, now, in 1901, Byron's son Wallace bought the property that had been sold to John Robeson in 1856. And that's, this is the mill road here. And there's the L road. So he owned this piece of property in here and that's the ADD 581, uh, accepting the cheese factory site and the school. And in 1908, Malcolm Coon sold the mill property to Wallace. And that's noted as S74. It, originally it was bigger, but that's what all that was left of it at that point. Uh, and it wasn't until 1949 that Wallace managed to buy the cheese factory. And that's here, Mark 15, 4557. Uh, and finally, in 1969, Wallace's daughter Mary and her husband, Russell Topping, uh, bought the old school site. Now, Russell's estate sold the school property uh, in 1986. And it isn't clear to me, uh, uh, at least to me, uh, what became of the old Robeson property. The descriptions and the remarks in the modern land records get very vague uh, by the early 1900s and, and almost impossible to follow. Now, a brief mention of the post office uh, should be made before we finish. Uh, now, we do know that the last postmaster was Wallace Brown, and the post office was in this house, uh, as well as there being a store here. And Bruce Topping indicated that they were at the back of the house here somewhere. Uh, now, this post office had a history all on its own. Uh, from 1857 to 62, it was known as the L Post Office. And then it closed for a few years. And when it was resurrected in 1871, it was known as Dickens until 1887. And it appears that there were members of the community who wanted to rebrand the area from L. Uh, but it didn't quite work. In 1887 to 1906, it was renamed as L Mills. And when Wallace became postmaster, it was renamed Glen L. Uh, and he operated it from 1906 until it closed in 1913. And then it became part of the rural mail system. Now, all that said, it's the property outlined in red uh, that we're dealing with today. 
Now it includes the original Deming purchase and much of uh, Chauncey Bellamy's original mill property. And thanks to the foresight of uh, Jane Watt Topping, it's now in your hands to be preserved for future generations. And speaking of future generations, the ancient falls are now being enjoyed by a new generation and it will be here for generations to come. <laughs> uh, and now pictured here are Talia and Luke Sitzma uh, in the spring of 2020. And because of this picture, they now are officially part of Elves history. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the correspondent uh, for Al Mills in an 1897 district report uh, in the Athens reporter will have the last word. Now, he or she uh, had a poetic streak and a clear vision uh, of what the falls meant. Well, the Elb of other days, the brewery, the distillery, the old landmarks has passed down the stream of time. Not one stone left upon another to tell the tale of its former self. Not a vestige remains to cast a shadow. And soon the young as well as the old, the present elf, will be numbered in the long, long ago. But the little stream, God's witness, will cascade and fret and foam in the spring bloom for the elf to come, elf to come as it does now. All right, thanks everyone for attending. Thanks.